Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <sighs> we are on sacred ground. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long, long way from home, a long, long way from home. Imagine being kidnapped or defeated in war, snatched up by your enemies who look like you, and sold you to a new enemy who looked nothing like you in color, and saw you as no more than a spoil of war, commerce. Imagine being sardined into a ship, stacked like spoons, shackled to others, moaning with the creak of timbers, reeling with the ocean as that boat rode, 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 but not gently down any stream, but across an ocean, the Middle Passage. For some, that Middle Passage was a passage to death. From the sickness that was incubated in the dark cargo holes of the ship because you slept and you ate and you defecated and you urinated where you sat and you laid. If you survived the voyage, you were valued again as currency. The first of you to enter what later would become the United States of America stepped out on dry land in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia. You were payment for tobacco. Those slaves from Angola were the beginning, but many more Africans were to follow from the dark continent. To those who bought and sold you, you were just bodies brawn, breeders, babies, really cattle. But there was also a brain, a soul, a living, breathing human being, God's creation. But those who bought and sold you refused to see that because of the color of your skin. You had a magnificent mind that you just wanted the opportunity to grow in knowledge in this new world. So you learn to read and write secretly. You learn to add and subtract secretly, often by candlelight, knowing it was against the law, knowing it could lead to your death. But you learned anyway, and you passed on to those in bondage a verbal history of who you were before you were enslaved. And you constantly believe that God did not bring you this far to lead you. <coughs> Sometimes you felt you truly were the motherless child. Now that is the root story. And unfortunately, the roots of racism black people still face today. The seed planted was slavery, <coughs> fertilized by the Civil War water during Reconstruction with Jim Crow laws, then pruned and reshaped after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then finally, with the election of the country's first black <coughs> president in 2008, some claim the roots of racism were uprooted and destroyed. That was a lie. <laughs> Just made back to the tiki torch white supremacist nighttime march and the next day rally, in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, just 128 miles away from where those slaves first landed in Jamestown, Virginia. In 2018, two black men arrested in a Philadelphia Starbucks accused of trespassing because they had not bought anything but asked to use the restroom while they were waiting for a colleague who happened to be white to talk business. You know, I've actually gotten to the place where I've stopped counting the number of stories about black people being
being stopped in the lobby of their own apartment building or their condo building and questioned about their presence and being asked to prove that they live there. And who can forget the black Yale graduate student who fell asleep in the common area of her dormitory and a white student called the campus police. Four officers showed up and wanted her to prove that she belonged there. I'm still trying to figure out what is it with white men and dark faces. <laughs> right now, Michael Earl had to resign from his job in Florida as elections chief because he went to a party in 2005 dressed in earrings, a New Orleans Saints bandana, a t-shirt with Katrina victim written on the front of it. And oh yes, he was in blackface. By the way, this was just two months after Hurricane Katrina destroyed the Gulf Coast. Now let's carry me back to old Virginia. By the way, that's a former state song for Virginia, a song that had to be rewritten because of the lyrics such as the old darky, but that's taking me away from my point. Virginia Governor Ralph Norton right now is fighting calls for his resignation after he admitted to portraying Michael Jackson in blackface back in the 80s. My point is very simple. These are not people who grew up during segregation. Many of these people are young, like you. So how do the roots of racism continue to grow like cuts do? And how do we change that? That is my brief message. Are the vestiges of Jim Crow and slavery still passed on from generation to generation through a book, a phrase? A retelling about that black cook. A retelling about the maid or the nanny. Or the yard man. Were these people raised by racist parents and taught to be racist? Is it just not being aware of our biases and admitting that we have them? Is it embracing the stereotypes we see in movies and on TV that shape our opinions on people, places, Things. Is it a need when times are tough to blame someone else for our financial and social shortcomings? Is it just not being sensitive to the feelings of others? Or is it just fear that constantly feeds racism? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. provided an answer in Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story in 1958. He wrote, Men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate because they are separated. So let's deal with the fear factor first. What are white people afraid of? What is your fear about black, brown, and yellow people? Where did that idea come from? And then how do you address it? That means self-examination, asking the tough questions, facing your fears, calling out yourself, and then doing something about it. Like getting to know somebody who is brown, black, or yellow. And not just that, hey, how you doing? <laughs> but getting to know each other personally by eating together, working together, going out together, studying together, playing together. But you know what I've learned? Being a teammate doesn't always mean you're really part of the team. Right. Yeah. How you see yourself may not be how your teammates see you. And that can be a problem in misunderstanding. I'm gonna give you an example. I recently emceed an event with football players and noticed how the teams were integrated, but not really. There was one little area that was like gumbo, with black and white students mixed together, laughing and talking, but mostly it was white with white and black with black. So one black student challenged me when I pointed that out. He said, I don't see color. <laughs> and this was a black student. 
That happens most often with black people and Latino people. Just listen to the examples we hear now for why we need a boardwalk. Another example of this was reported last week when actor Liam Neeson admitted that he walked around with a big old club in black neighborhoods in London some 40 years ago, quote, looking to be set upon so that I could unleash physical violence. The reason? A friend of his had been raped. He asked her, well, what was the race of the man? She said it was a black man, and it enraged him. But he later admitted to Robin Roberts in an interview that had the man been Scottish, British, or Lithuanian, he would have done the same thing in their neighborhood. <laughs> Two things really bothered me about this. And question that needed a follow-up. The Scot, the Brit, or the Lithuanian would have had to speak for the person to guess their heritage. They are white. But first, why did he even ask? What was the race of the rapist? What was more important <coughs> was how was she? Should the woman's condition, mentally, physically, and spiritually, been addressed rather than what was the color of the rapist? He has apologized. Because now he's smarter. I want him to start out smarter. All right. All right. Other ways to fight racism during Black History Month, that be wary of the Sharks Month of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> National Hispanic Heritage Month, September 15th to October 15th. Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in May. Learn about the contributions made by these groups because their history is your history too. Attend events celebrating these different characters. Minority people make history, but all of us benefit from it. And it's the same with Women's History Month in March. Do your research. Now again, I said my message today is not just for white people, it's also for black people. I love that show, Dear White People. <laughs> I wish they'd make one called Dear Black People too. <laughs> James Weldon Johnson wrote, White America cannot save itself if it prevents us from being saved. But in the nature of things, white America is not going to yield what rightfully belongs to us without a struggle kept up by us. In that struggle, our watchword needs to be work, 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 and our rallying cry should be fight, fight, fight. We as black people need to check ourselves. Are we still engaged in the fight for civil rights and human rights? Are we still letting the stereotypes define us? Do we pick up the phone when the media describes a five foot four white bank robber or a five foot four bank from college? I grew up in a small town in Louisville, Kentucky. But my mother always said, don't set limits on yourself. It's not where you're from, it's where you're going to. All right. Do you let these things stop you from dreaming and working and causing you to fail? Michelle Obama in her book, Becoming, wrote something that just touched my heart. Failure is a feeling long before it becomes an actual result. It's vulnerability that breeds with self-doubt and then is escalated often deliberately by fear. Don't be afraid of being the first person in your family to do anything. Don't be afraid of being the best you can be. Don't let other people define you. You define you. Build up your self-esteem. Be the first in your family to go to college, to get a master's degree, to get a doctorate. Become the first woman president of the University of Georgia. <laughs> and I'm going to take one of you middle school students to do it because I'm taking that long.
400 years ago, 400 years ago, African people were brought to these shores and stripped of their dignity, their language, and their culture. 400 years later, their descendants are stripped of their dignity and culture and rights still because of racism. Why does this continue? It's finally time for us, you young people, I'm going to be the ones to do it, to get to that root of racism, yank it out of the culture, and destroy it for one simple reason. Our lives depend upon it. Our prosperity depends upon it. So I'm going to let Dr. King have the last word. There is no separate black path to power and fulfillment that does not intersect white paths. And there is no separate white path to power and fulfillment short of social disaster that does not share that power with black aspirations for freedom and human dignity. We are bound together in a single garment of destiny. And that is the only way we shall overcome some